Hey guys, it's Sandro here and welcome to part 2 and the paint correction stage of the detail on this BMW X5. Now in part 1 I took you guys through the extremely vital wash, chemical and mechanical decontamination process in order to strip the paint and trims back to a clean bare state. And I'm going to kick part 2 off by doing some pre-correction prep work starting with an IPA wipe down of the entire vehicle. So for this I'm using NV Clarity which is essentially an isopropyl alcohol and deionized water mix together with some mold cleaning and lubricating agents all of which are tuned to ensure this pre-correction wipe down is as safe and effective as possible. I'm going to start spraying it onto a panel at a time Use a first cloth to gently spread it over the surface and then a second cloth to buff it clean and streak free. And I'm going to do this over all the paint and trims. After a comprehensive decontamination process, there's always going to be some remaining detergent and chemical residue, as well as some mold dust, dirt and water smudges and streaks that get kicked up over the vehicle. It's just normal, especially after blow drying a vehicle. So as my goal before paint correction is to have the paint as clean and bare as possible, not only so this contamination doesn't get into my polishing pads, but also so I can do my other pre-correction work better, such as the paint inspection, paint measurement, and masking up the trims without any of that getting in the way. So on to measuring the paint. Now overall I'd say the average paint thickness of this BMW X5 was just over 100 microns, which is a little less than I'd like to see on a relatively new car. But honestly it's not too far off the lower paint thickness that's been applied to most new vehicles these days. I should also mention that about half the panels on this X5 are non-ferrous or alloy metal that don't tend to have primer applied as they obviously don't rust. So that could explain the slightly lower paint thickness readings on certain panels, but I do have to say that I did get a few readings in the low 70s that did make me a little nervous. But in any case, all the panels look to be original with no previous repairs or resprays, which is great to see. And the paint job itself looks pretty good and what you'd expect from BMW. Now the hard thing about estimating how much of that paint thickness was clear coat on this car was that the door jams that usually have much lower readings and very little clear coat applied were actually giving me quite high readings which again made me a little nervous. So this basically means that BMW either did a good thing on this car and applied almost as much clear coat on the door jams as they did on the other panels or BMW did a bad thing on this car and just applied very little clear coat everywhere. I'd like to think it's the former, but as a responsible and cautious detailer, I have to approach this car assuming it's the latter. With the paint and trims completely bare and given an IPA wipe down, this is a time you can really adequately assess its condition and severity of the defects you're gonna have to address. 
Now being a pearl white, it's just extremely hard to capture the defects on camera, as this is one of the best paints in relation to hiding defects. But once we get to some of the coloured trims, you'll hopefully see its condition a little better in the footage. Now although there's certainly a decent amount of swirls, scratches, a few scuffs, a bit of transfer stains and water spots, it's not awful or completely trashed by any means. But taking into consideration that this X5 is only 18 months old, it's definitely a lot worse than you'd expect from a relatively new car. So I can see that I've got a bit of work ahead of me and based on the paint thickness readings, I'm really going to have to find an effective combination to address the defects and also remove as little clear coat as possible. The last pre-correction step before getting down to business was using tape to mask some of the sensitive rubber and plastic trims during the correction stage to protect these trims and my pads from damage or unwanted residue. Masking is just one of those things that takes a bit of practice to get good and quick at. I guess the advice I'd give here is to try and place it precisely and tuck the sides of the tape into the trims as best you can to avoid picking up adhesive residue from those edges when you polish over the tape. But if you get it wrong, just pull it off and try again. Masking is pretty forgiving that way. Also make sure to press it down after you apply it to make sure that it won't pull up during polishing. So I want to do in a test section to see what combination of machine, compound pad and technique is going to remove these defects in the least aggressive manner. As a starting point I used my 21mm 6 inch DA polisher with a ShineMate Blue Intermediate Foam Pad and NV Morph All-in-One Primer Polish. As far as technique goes, I added a little more compound to my fresh pad to prime it up set my machine speed to 4.5, spread the product into a half metre square and using both moderate pressure and a moderate arm speed, I completed about 3 passes in a 90 second polishing set. I'll leave the footage running at normal speed for this first section so you guys can see it in real time from start to finish. And while you watch that, I'll discuss why I started with this combination. Firstly, I chose the 6 inch 21mm DA for this job as this is a huge vehicle with a lot of real estate to cover, so this large polisher should help increase productivity here. Secondly, apart from some older single stage painted BMWs, I've never corrected a white clear coated BM that had soft paint. They've always been either medium to hard or rock hard, and larger more aggressive polishers can certainly help in that case. Thirdly, as far as using NV Morph, I wanted a product that's going to address my concerns with perhaps not having as much clear coat on this vehicle as I'd like to see. So Morph being a light to medium primer polish won't really remove very much clear coat at all and additionally it will fill in some minor defects and allow me to still apply a ceramic coating over it. As far as the ShineMate Blue Pad goes, it's also a rather non-aggressive pad. But it's generally a fantastic one step pad especially on mid to harder paint types with light to moderate defects. And lastly as I briefly mentioned in part 1, 
This job is going to be more of a budget friendly high end detail, meaning that it's not an all out concourse style job. I have a limited time and I have a limited budget to get a great result. So although I'm still looking for a good 85 to 90 plus improvement, it's not going to be that 95% plus close to perfection job. Now as we have a look at the results, I'll start by saying that it took me ages just to get the lighting, camera exposure and angle right so that you guys could see the results a little better in the footage. But hopefully you can see that it was a big improvement. I'd say removing a good 70 to 80% of the defects while also improving clarity and gloss levels quite noticeably. Now around the body line edges of the panel, the correction was far less. But as I'm going to use a smaller pad for those areas, I'm not too fussed about that right now. So overall, it's a pretty good result and improvement, but I still need a little more correction to get it to a standard that I'm happy with. Now the easiest way to get that extra 10 or so percent defect removal I'm after is going to be by making some very minor changes to both my pad selection and technique. So the Lake Country Blue HDO foam pad actually has a very similar surface texture and aggression to the ShineMate pad. However, because the Lake Country pad is quite a bit stiffer, it's able to transmit more of its cutting power while still retaining its great finishing qualities. Add to that just some very slight technique changes, such as a tiny bump in machine speed and a slightly lower arm speed, and just a fraction more pressure, and my guess is that I should be able to squeeze a little more cut or defect removal from this combination without having to compromise its finishing abilities. Now again guys, I know it's not easy to see the results clearly on this pearl white paint. But I can tell you that in person I was seeing a good 90% plus defect removal and some definite gloss, clarity and saturation improvements. So for me, being that this was quite a gentle overall combination, that's not going to remove much clear cut at all, but still be able to remove and to some extent fill in almost all the defects, was a clear winner in this particular case. Now being that this X5 has some really sharp and dramatic body lines and curves, a large throw 6 inch DA is just going to struggle to correct, but more importantly is just going to be way too risky and aggressive on those vulnerable body lines. I really need to use a smaller 3 inch pad to get both safe and effective correction in those areas. Now keeping with the theme that this is a large vehicle with lots of real estate and paint that seems to be on the harder side, I decided to grab my cordless rotary with a smaller extension bar and do a test to see how it would work alongside my larger DA in another test section. Now with the rotary I used a slightly lower machine speed, just light to moderate pressure and a moderate to slightly faster arm speed allowing the extra rotation speed of the machine to do the work and really just concentrating on the curves around the body lines. I then followed up with my larger DA slightly overlapping the rotary in order to achieve the best and most uniform finish. You'll hopefully see that this really worked a treat to get the whole section including the flatter and curved areas uniformly corrected and finished to a great level that I was really happy with. So starting with my rotary and smaller 3 inch pad. I firstly completed all the body line and edge work in the more intricate areas and then followed up with my larger DA and pads to complete all the flatter work in a general working method all over the bonnet on this X5. Now I'm about 5 foot 11 at the start of the day and probably closer to 5 foot 10 by the end of the day. But I can tell you that even with step stools and ladders it was a real struggle reaching the center parts of the bonnet and roof. And by the end of correcting those panels, I can also tell you that my back was a little worse for wear. These larger 4x4s never used to phase me as much in my younger days, but I can tell you that they definitely take a much greater toll on my body these days. In any case, after having to stop, rest and gently stretch my back a little to recover, I did get through those monster sized panels and I hope you will see in the footage that they did end up coming up extremely well. Yeah. 
With the roof and really the rest of the vehicle's paint, it was a similar correction method using my smaller pads to firstly do all the intricate and edge work and I then followed up with my larger pads for the flatter, larger areas. I should also mention that with the sunroof, I used the same combination as I'm also going to coat the roof glass with the same ceramic coating. Sometimes water spots do require a little more aggression to remove. But the ones on the roof glass actually came out rather easily compared to the ones on the windscreen and side glass which I'll talk a little more about in a bit. I guess the other thing to point out here is that on the piano black plastics, I was still seeing a bit of haze in the finish after correction. 
So I did a quick switch to my mini DA polisher, the orange Lake Country foam pad and finesse polish to finish those more sensitive trims down a little better. This is the thing with detailing, not everything is always going to be straightforward and by the numbers. So you need to be able to adapt and address issues on the fly. I know that this exact combination works perfectly for me about 90% of the time on softer black piano plastics. So without having to overthink it, I just went straight to something I know and trust here and it paid off allowing me to quickly sort out this little issue. Now, as I mentioned before, there were a few water spots or etchings on the windscreen and side glass that using a foam pad and fine polish just weren't removing. So I had to find a slightly more aggressive combination to remove them. This turned out to be Shoal Concepts S20 Black on the Rubez Blue Coarse Wool Pads that dealt with those defects super easy. The other thing to mention here is that I am gonna be using a more specific glass coating on all this glass that doesn't necessarily play as well with a primer polish. So that was another reason I had to find a different combination to the one I was using on the paint. The main reason I use specific glass or windscreen coatings on the front, rear and side glass is that paint coatings tend to more often lead to wiper chatter and even more wear on the side glass as the windows rub up against the rubber seals when they go up and down. If it wasn't for these issues, paint coatings would actually work just as well on all the vehicle's glass. I'll lastly add here that not all car glass is created or behaves equal. Although it's important the glass feels tacky and sounds squeaky as a sign that it's completely clean and bare, the glass on this X5 was super tacky to the point that it was really pulling out all the fibers from my cloths as I wiped it. So once again, I had to address that on the fly and switched to some more specific glass cleaning cloths in order to get a nice, clean, lint-free finish.
I guess some other things to point out about this job is that as much as I tried to resist using even smaller one and two inch pads and polishes because they are very time consuming to use and I was limited in my time and budget here, I just found a few areas where it was really hard and more importantly safe to use larger pads to get the level of correction I was after safely. So on some of the super thin window trims that were quite scratched up, as well as the wing mirrors and even parts of the rear boot and lights, I did cave and pulled out my micro pads to solve those issues, even though it meant spending a little more time than I had budgeted for. If we could detail the same vehicle with the same paint, same trims, similar defects, and have customer expectations be the same every time, then quoting a job for a price and estimating time and labour would be an absolute breeze. But this unfortunately isn't the case. Every car's shape and size is different. So are the trims fixed to it, as is the paint type, the specific defects it incurs, 
and most importantly, the customer's expectations that can vary immensely. The number one question I get from other detailers, especially starting out in the business, is how do I know how much to charge for each job? The unfortunate answer, even though I try to answer it a little more eloquently, is basically how long is a piece of string? It's hard guys, and no matter how long you've been doing this, you will continuously get it wrong. And in almost every case you get it wrong, you will be undercharging and hurting yourself. But hopefully, the longer you're in this game, that will become a less common occurrence. But more broadly, mistakes are just an important part of life. And sometimes, no matter how well you calculate all the available data, you'll still make bad calls. But failing doesn't have to be all bad if we firstly take responsibility for what we did wrong, don't blame others for our own mistakes, and lastly, just ask yourself what I could have done differently to avoid it as you always have a choice. That's how you extract good from a bad situation and grow as an individual. As if you don't own your own mistakes and just blame others for your own failures, you can't learn from them and all you become is a bitter, entitled victim. Blaming the industry, blaming your competitors and blaming customers for your own failures. Detailing is such a big part of my life that I can almost relate anything to it. And I know that all the highs and lows I've experienced as a detailer have to some extent shaped me as a person and certainly taught me some valuable lessons in life. So I guess all I'm trying to say here is that you will make mistakes, but how you deal with them and what you extract from them is the important part. I'll leave you guys here with the rest of the footage and I really hope you stay tuned for part 3 and the final chapter of the detail on this magnificent BMW X5 in which I'll be protecting the finish and showing you guys the finish results. If you enjoyed this video and would like to say thanks and help support future content, you can do so by buying me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash ccad, which I'll have a link to in the description box and thank you everyone for the support so far. As always, I really hope you guys enjoyed and found this video useful. Please give it a like, comment below, share it with others and subscribe to this channel to show you support for this content and I'll see you guys soon.
left with a bro.